Well, <laughs> okay, so let's begin. So we go back to the very foundation of the sound production and violin playing. So it all boils down to how you handle the bow. First, if your arm, the entire arm is not flexible, of course the sound would not be uh, open as well. So when you play with an arm, with a stiff arm, the sound would be like this. It will also sound stiff. Therefore, when you make sure that the arm is flexible, then the sound will also become more normal and open. So. As I keep on telling my students, even back then, that the elbow should be very still. You only move the elbow when you cross from one string to another. So from G down to E. Now, there will be a problem if you're going to cross from one string to another, especially if it's G or E. So how will you manage to do that? Um, I advise that you will actually lift the elbow a little bit higher for G and then just a little bit down for E. And then the rest would be done with the elbow. Oh, I'm sorry, with the wrist. So if the wrist is flexible, you can easily cross from G to E. But it requires practice. Um, when you practice the string crossings, it will benefit your elbow a lot. So string crossings, especially open string, would make your sound uh, more um, um, smooth. So here, like this one. But when you place the bow, it should have a little bit of bite. Not too much, it should be halfway um, between the, the stick and the hair of your bow. So if there's, for example, one, one half a centimeter uh, apart from each other, the stick and the hair strand, it should be half a bit going down to the string. So it should bite like halfway through. Or visually you should see that the hair strands are about to touch the hair of the, the stick of your bow. So, I don't know if you see it, but here it is. And of course, when you approach the upper part of the bow, you will need to put a little bit of pressure from here, from the pointer finger, a little bit down. Just need to flick it from your normal position here to there. So flick it there. As you approach the tip of the bow, see that? And adding a little bit more pressure because this part of the bow is actually much lighter compared to the frog, where all the screws and the metal parts are located. So, so from here. And vice versa, you should also uh, lessen the weight or the pressure you apply as you approach the front, especially when you're starting from the very end or the knot of the front. So here it should be much less. Um, I used to practice with the bow tilted a little bit as I start uh, with the down bow. So the, the hair strand should be facing a little bit uh, towards you. So like this, and then flat bow right away after playing about an inch from the very end, so here. And then flat bow. And then tilt a little bit. That is to avoid the, the scratchy sound. Um, sometimes, of course, it's unavoidable, especially when you're playing fast pieces. That is why it is recommended that when you play fast uh, passages, you never go down here or else it will be too bouncy and it will just bounce off the string 
too much that we cannot control it anymore. So here's Uh, okay, maybe you should turn up your volume a little bit because, well, most of them could hear my voice. So here, so again, from here, from the frog, tilt the ball a little bit towards you, the hair strand should be facing you, and then flick it flat to the string. And then apply a bit of pressure, gradually applying harder as you approach the tip of the bow. But once you reach the tip of the bow, you should not tilt the bow away from you or towards you. I mean, the hair strand should, should not be tilted away or towards you. It should always be flat to the string. So, And then back, gradually lessening the pressure. So if you try it, uh, if you try open strings, well, let's say whole notes or maybe um, tight whole notes. I suggest actually you do eight counts, so four, four. So. The longer you do this, the better you can control the bow. So if you start slow, if you use a metronome, of course you have to use a metronome. If you use a metronome, I suggest you go to 60 beats per minute and then two whole notes per note or per open string. Try to sustain the same volume of, uh, of of the sound from down up to the point. The notes should not they should not sound like there's there are crescendos and decrescendos. This is what you should not do. Because basically it is easier to control the bow when it's here, at the middle part. Difficult here, much more difficult here. But that's the purpose why you have to practice open strings. Whether you're advanced, intermediate, like, like me, maybe advanced, I still do practice open strings because that is to realign the whole arm again. Another example I gave last time in the previous session should also practice doing double stops, open strings, just to control the bow when you're doing a string crossings. But this is like a shortcut to doing string crossings between two neighboring uh, strings. So if you're playing on two neighbor strings like G and D, put them, put the bow on the two of them at the same time. So simultaneously, you have to pull the bow. And the key to doing this is you really have to listen if the volume of the two strings are equal, if they're the same. It would help if you could record your own performance. It's the reason why I require or I, I really uh, push for students to record their uh, performances, their practices, so that they can actually review afterwards if you did well or if you need to do uh, a lot of practice more. So, uh, listen well. If one string is louder, then you better ask yourself which one that is. And then you need to fix it because maybe you're putting too much pressure in that string while in the other string you're not actually touching it uh, that much. So. Okay. If you get this correctly, it will really help you a lot when you do string crossings because the moment you place your bow or um, yeah, the bow onto the strings, so if you put it there at the same time, simultaneously so onto the string, that's already the height of the elbow when you do string crossings. 
and all you need to do is focus on uh, smoothening the sound when you play uh, the various exercises you do on so you those uh, strings. So G and D, that if you got used to it, go down to the next two strings. At first, it will sound a little bit um, scratchy because for sure you're not used to doing that yet. Uh, it will take a little, a little time to master it, but it won't take the whole day. It will only take you maybe um, two minutes to master each string, and then you can move forward. So. have to push yourself. If it gets uh, easy or it gets really, if it's getting easier and easier, then you'll have to slow down the movement of the bow more. So when you glide the bow and then suddenly it becomes easy, then slow it down a little bit more. And uh, for example, um, if I'm uh, if I'm new in practicing this uh, um, exercise, I'll just have to put this uh, bow onto the two strings, like uh, oh, now on A and E strings. So, for example, I'm a beginner, so for sure the speed would be like this. Then challenge yourself because that's too easy then slow it down. Always practice with a tilted bow at the beginning and then flat bow right away. So. When that speed gets easy, of course you'll have to slow it down again. So. As it gets easier, the slower you should go. That's the, the challenge for having a really controlled bow when playing. It's important that you pay attention on the elbow and the shoulder. One mistake that any beginner, well, not just beginners, because even advanced and intermediate um, students or violinists would sometimes lift their shoulder and that's wrong. Uh, why is it wrong? Because you're going against the, the natural uh, law of gravity. So it's more difficult when you when you fight with the gravity because you're trying to pull and then carry the weight of the arm. Therefore, you need to lower this down. Both shoulders should be down. It's advisable for those who are uh, long necked to use the uh, uh, shoulder rest so that you, you won't have to lift the left shoulder up when you play, just to put the violin in place parallel to the ground. So both shoulders should be down. And then if your violin is actually pointing downwards like that, all you need to do is this. Push this backwards, there. Now it's perpendicular to the ground. And when you practice open strings, always hold the violin here to relax the heart. So don't lift it, put it down. So uh, parallel to the ground, and then this one. At first, you really have to look at the, this angle. So you would see both the bow, uh, how it's spiking the string and the, the strings themselves so that you would see if they're vibrating well and of course use your ears. It's very important that you practice listening to every uh, sound you make when you play the violin. So. Some exercises I suggest is if if you're going to glide the bow slowly, you'll have to also do a fast uh, bowing stroke or fast bow stroke. So. Now, visually, you should see those two strings that you're uh, playing on um, vibrate like tremendously. Like I don't know if you can see it vibrate. But 
you should see both uh, vibrations uh, having the same height. That's when you can tell that you are actually putting the proper um, pressure to the two strings. So. Um, practicing open strings, I would say about five to 10 minutes a day. Well, it depends on your needs. Sometimes there are people or there are violinist students who have really a nice arm already, then you'll just have to do it like warm up for a maximum five minutes. But for those who I keep on telling me to really work on their arm more and longer, well, I think you really have to practice only the open strings for, well, give time for the right arm to mature. Should really have to be flexible when you play violin because if it's not flexible, you really cannot advance to um, to a better uh, standard because you would remain um, like the sound of a beginner if you don't practice the right arm. So there are also those who already could play, but then there is always there's always the lack of pressure onto the violin. That's why when you listen. It sounds like there's something uh, missing to the, the, the to the tones because you're looking actually our ears are looking for the the uh, the fullness of the the sound of the instrument or should I say the robustness of the violin sound. So I used to play like this when I was a beginner. My teacher told me, I don't hear anything. I said, what? I'm playing. But then she said, it's not about the notes that you can play. It's about the, the artistic uh, capacity of the violin to produce that robust sound. It should really uh, come out as a, as a big tone since the violin is already a small instrument and the pitch is so high. But it should appear like it's a cello. So that's what she said. Therefore, when I started practicing, I had to play a little bit more pressure. Well, that's what you said. You have to put a bit more pressure. So, and then she said, you should hear the flick sound or the bite sound. Then. Even if you're doing a deficiency. not just fighting, you should control the, the, the bow also. Now that sound is different from how I did it earlier. The sound of that one is too thin. Hopefully you could hear the difference. Um, because I'm just streaming this out. Hopefully you hear the robustness of the second one. Compared to this one. Okay, so if you have questions, actually you can just type it here. And another thing, when you practice, um, sometimes when you browse too much on YouTube that you actually get lost. You have to stick to uh, one school of violin technique for you to improve. I'm not saying my own technique or where I belong, but you have to choose one. So for me, when you hold the bow, this is the, the foundation, of course. Um, when you hold the ball, it should be as easy as possible. Like when you drop the arm, you can see the, the curvature of the hand. So stay there, and that's how you hold it. No extra movement. Okay, so my position is like this. Slightly pointer forward, and then pinky, well, all the way backwards, and then those two fingers uh, close together. And then all I need to do is put a little bit of pressure here if I want it a little um, louder, and then lessen it a bit if I want it softer. So when you practice this, carry the the weight of the the bow 
uh, by the hand or by the fingers. So try flicking it up and then down, up, down. And then practice also doing the, uh, the twist here to go from inwards to go flat, flat way. So inwards and then flat way. But without the violin, you should be able to do that as well. So when you practice, just lift the bow up and down and twist. Up, up, down, up, down. And then for the, uh, for the twisting, start with up bow, position this way, and then outwards. Now, look at the joint of my thumb. So that's actually the driver. If you're driving a car, that's the driver. It's your thumb. So if this is stiff and locked in place, you won't be able to control the bow easily. So flexible thumb, flexible fingers, they are the ones controlling the bow. And then the height of the, um, the bow is determined by the elbow. The drivers of the bow, again, are the fingers, okay? And then the height of the elbow will determine what um, string you are playing on. I hope that is clear. It is uh, also important to do individual practices uh, just for the bowing arm. Uh, last time I, I told you, you can do this kind of exercise where you'll have to uh, crawl like a spider onto the violin's uh, bow stick. But again, this should not lift upwards or else you'll be carrying the weight of the arm. So there. And then you need to slow it down. Don't do this too fast. So for example, you're already there. Lower that if it starts to go up. If it starts going up like that, it begins to feel like it's so heavy. So lower it down. So the moment you feel that the voice is getting heavy, that's the time when your uh, shoulder is actually lifting upwards already. So be mindful of this. Okay, and then fast forward back to playing position. Okay, there. Now, another good example for uh, bow control is to do um, staccato uh, bowing on open string. So, but this will be like the um, pre-exercise for doing flying staccato, although we're not doing flying staccato today. So we start here at the very end. So pull the bow, stop. Stop, 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 until you reach the tip. Because then your arm is forced to control the bow. It's not just gliding down very long. But your fingers, your hand should control the bow when you do this. Hopefully you see my arm, my fingers controlling the bow as I pull the bow downwards and then up. So when you do the upward um, staccato exercise, it's actually the pinky that's scooping the bow to lift it up. So scoop, 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 scoop. When you do down bow strokes, it's the thumb that pulls the bow down. So down, 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 and then finger scoops up when you do up bow. So up, up. Up, 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 up. Apply it until your playing will be.
but while doing that, you also have to be mindful of this part of your arm. It should not move at all times. It will only move when you cross to the other strings. Again, as a reminder. So on the G string, this is actually more difficult for G string because the, the gravity is not working for you. It's not helping you at all. So you'll have to control it more. By flip. By So, in short, if you do that exercise, it will force all your fingers to get flexible, to relax, for the whole arm to relax, not just the fingers. So, all of the whole arm. Pop, 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 pop. Once you can control that, you can actually do it faster. So, as you speed up. So whenever you um, increase the tempo, it will be more difficult because it will really require your thumb and your pinky to work harder, the two of them. So down go, ta 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 This is very tiring for, the, um, for those two fingers, the thumb and the pinky. So up. Pinching the book. Pinch, 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 pinch. And then when you flick it up, pinch, 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 pinch. The key to perfecting this exercise lie on these two fingers. Well, thumb is not a finger, so thumb and the pinky finger. So. you practice something, special open strings, you always practice on all four strings. Don't forget that. Because if you practice often only on G string, you might become very good in playing at this uh, part or at this string, on this string. But the one you transfer down or cross down to E string might be too difficult already or too late when, when you need to play uh, applying that technique. So always practice equal time well, most probably equal time for all the strings. But if you think that, for example, the E string is more difficult to uh, to play, then um, have more time practicing on that string, and vice versa if it's uh, the other string. Okay. So, are there any questions so far? As a how long should be? Oh yeah, so now you know that these two should, well, at the end of the day, if you really practice that well, they would become flexible. They will be forced to will be more flexible. Because it's the only way you can master the exercise or the technique. There's actually an advanced exercise. Um, well for other teachers, but for me, I think it's very basic because you need to uh, make your hand flexible, especially those two fingers. Because once they become flexible, it's so easy to control the ball already. Because then you'll have facility to do uh, attaches and of course short uh, ones. You can also easily uh, shape the bow when in the future you're going to play uh, ricochets 
or spiccatos. So all those advanced uh, bowing techniques lie on these two important fingers. So master it and you'll be fine. So <laughs> yeah, there's a tendency for our pinky fingers always to uh, go off or fly off in Filipino. <laughs> so because the pinky is not flexible enough and because you lack practice doing that exercise I just showed you, you should practice it all the time. For now, since all of you are mostly beginners, you don't have to practice it every day. Include that in your warm-ups. First exercise here, I call it spider, especially if I have my small students. Or this way. At first, People would say, or students would say, this is the easier one. Actually, it's not. This is the more difficult one, because as you reach the tip of the bow, you will have to go back to where you started. So fast forward, should be able to come back here with the proper um, bow hole. OK, so actually, you should practice on those two, horizontal and vertical. There. And then another exercise that I think most teachers uh, tell their students is to do this. Is to this is called a whip. So whip it. You should hear the, the whip sound, like in in western not western western but in western films, you know, Wild West. Like when they when they throw their lassos, you can hear the the swoosh of the sound. That's also good for these two. And of course, flexibility of the wrist. So once you're able to control that, if you add that to your exercises, then you're good to go. So what else? Well, that's actually the, the goal for you not to drop the bow as you do that exercise. At first, you'll have to do it a little bit slower. Of course, no, no swoosh sound yet. And then gradually going faster and apply more pressure until you could control the bow. Don't um, attempt doing it like right away with a very fast tempo and very strong pressure because you might drop the bow and goodbye bow. <laughs> so here. At first, lower tempo. Just test the waters and then go faster. And then, yeah. Until you could hear the squish sound. So what else could I share today? Oh my God, do you have questions? Um, oh, I didn't see that one. So yes, you have to force for now your pinky to stay on to the stick of the bow. Because yeah, I already told you why it's very important to have it there, to stay there because this one is actually the one, this finger is the one driving your bow when you do up bows. So the tache is actually the one that pushes your bow up, should be. Then you have a natural flick from down to up. If they could move, um, openly. At first, oh yeah, yeah, it will be very difficult at first. So, or you can just do just with the flick of your fingers. Of 
members observe your uh, whole arm while doing that. Yeah, good thing also I'm using a carbon fiber one. Well, for those who have carbon fiber uh, bows, you can easily practice this, not worrying about breaking your bone. <laughs> and then, what else? Any questions? <laughs> So, um, for um, spiccato, you're going to apply exactly the same technique, but then in a faster manner. But for some uh, violinists, um, they would lift their pinky once uh, they're doing ricochets. Sometimes I do this also to make sure that the bow jumps off of the string. Remember earlier when you're doing slower in, in, where you, when you're doing slower tempo. I told you that the pink is the one lifting this uh, bow to driver to go up to avoid um, a flying off of the string. Therefore, since that is the, what it does, if you take it off, when you play in faster speed, the bow would naturally would bounce off, would ricochet onto the strings. So, that's your spiccato, like when you play the Four Seasons uh, Summer. Um, what else? Yes, I would recommend, advise you to post how you practice also the, uh, just the, the bowing uh, technique I just showed you today. Yeah, so last time I differentiated the spiccato from staccato. Um, staccato normally is just pop up well, the very definition of staccato is that there's a, a gap in between notes. You don't play the entirety of the, uh, the, the tone. If it's a quarter note, maybe it's only a dotted, double dotted eight note. So there's a, a short rest between notes. Staccato would be... This is staccato. You don't need actually to lift the bow. Spaccato or ricochets the one that ricochets off the or bounces off the string. This is spiccato, fast uh, tempo spiccato because it's jumping off of the string. But if it's only staccato, then it just stays onto the string, but with short um, separation. So. you're going to play uh, spiccato. That will be spiccato. But if it's a uh, staccato, if it's detaché, then you're going to play uh, the full value of each note. So. And then staccato. <laughs> Spiccato. I hope the differences between those bowings are clear. And then, yes, if you're doing 30 seconds already, especially if you want it sounding like spiccato, then. As long as the whole arm relaxes when you play 30 second notes, this is fine to, to lift. 
it's also difficult when state when it stays there, and then you want to do um, speed cut. It's also difficult. So, other questions? Um, Martelé is like hammering. So, so more forceful when you play. So. So, if you have more questions, you can just uh, ask now. If not, then you should spend the rest of the time practicing <laughs> the, the technique. Oh, yes, uh, uh, simple piece you can recommend so you can play with wide uh, range of dynamics. Actually, the best. Um, Exercise, not really a piece, is to play the the your most simple um, scale where you can apply dynamics. For example, just one octave of B major scale starting in D. So then play it loudly. smoothens and then you can also do the different uh, bowing techniques but You should also practice doing the scales smoothly by the wing slurs. self check so all of those different techniques and what else yeah oh that the shade is just uh, playing the full volume of each tone if oh i think i i did that already uh, yeah, for the dynamics, this is very important. So um, sometimes we see a lot of P's and D's, but they're, they're just ornaments there. We don't actually focus on that. Actually, they're very important because that is how you would shape the, the music or how the composer wants you to play the music. So if you want to uh, phrase it according to the composer's wish, you really have to follow what's written onto the uh, music sheet or the, the, the composition. So, for example, um, and then there's a part there where you have to play it loudly. The exercise for it is to do again, the, uh, to uh, master different pressures onto the bow. So, if you want, the, the, the dynamics to go louder, a little bit more pressure, but the bow should move faster. If it's piano, this is more difficult actually because you'll have to move the bow um, slowly and the same time applying pressure.
So playing a piano properly is difficult. First, when you apply the pressure on playing loud, uh, loudly, you just have to add more pressure and they're good to go. But then if it's piano, the fullness of each tone should be like playing uh, loud passages, like but with the volume tone down to a minimum. So when you practice, you need to slow, slow down the movement if you wanna do um, piano, but you should not be just putting the bow onto the string. You still need to apply the bike. You should still hear the bike. It should sound like it's so full and fat, even if it's really soft. So, it's still bike on the string. Not like this. But there will be times that um, you would be required to lessen the pressure, actually, um, in advance of is like Mozart or those classical composers, that, like real classical, not baroque, not all of those the classical um, composers, you would lessen the pressure. And when you play, there shouldn't be any scratches at all. So, that's actually half of a hair strands used. I, I tilted the bow. I only used half the amount of hair strands. But don't get me wrong, that's for the more advanced techniques and not for all the pieces. For now, you will, uh, you're going to use all, maximize the use of the hair strands, so flat onto the strings. Even if it's piano, flat, uh, flat bow. And bite. You yourself could actually hear the difference between piano that has body and piano that's just piano. Okay, so what else? Uh, no more questions? I think that's a lot already. Uh, um, you would have to review this uh, video to absorb everything, or maybe maybe you could uh, write down the different uh, breakdowns of the techniques I just uh, shared today, so that you could master it. So I advise you send a practice video because I, I cannot give one and one to all of you. So what else? Mm -hmm. Three minutes. <laughs> uh. Yeah, sometimes the fingers move away or closer to each other when you do bowing. That's the natural reaction or uh, um, what your body does naturally, so you don't have to force it to stay as long as they're not lifting off or getting off of the bow, you don't have to mind trying to put them all in place at the same time. I mean, uh, putting them in the right places. Because naturally when you're doing downs and up bows, the, the fingers, I told you earlier, they, they drive you where you want to uh, uh, put the bow on to if you want to do an up or down bow. So you will have to just leave them be. The fingers stay where they are, as long as they don't lift off. Okay, so for now, you will have to practice those techniques. Um, you can apply it to any uh, exercise in Saftwick or Rimali. If you're playing um, some pieces already, you might want to um, explore. Maybe you could start playing uh, something, even if it's a popular music or pop music, sounding like a classical one, so it's all up to you. Uh, okay, welcome everyone. You can just uh, review this afterwards because I'm going to. Uh, I think this automatically uploads. Yeah. Okay, so see you next time. 
So thank you for staying there. Thank you so much already. <laughs> okay, bye bye. How do I stop out oh, there? The red button. Bye.